I'm I'm excited. I'm excited, and you're my publisher. <laughs> no pressure there, right? So, um, I do want to put a disclaimer before I start. Matthew Harms is here, and he and I have talked many times. So, some of this stuff I've borrowed from him, and some of the work that or presentations that he does. So, and if you do get a chance to go to his presentations, I would definitely uh, recommend it. But I've known Matt for for a few years now. But um, obviously, I mean, I, I feel that in my field, in probably anyone's field, whatever it is you may do for business, a lot of it is you have to educate someone who might end up potentially being your client because they don't know what they don't know. You've known it for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. It's, you know, it's that simple to you. You could do it in your sleep. And it really comes down to educating people. Um, I always, um, one of the first question is this conversation that I'm going to have is basically about books, about your business. This is not autobiographies or memoirs or, you know, writing a horror fiction novel or anything like that. But why do you think people buy or read nonfiction business books? And part of my screen, I can't see. So I'll let Scott, if someone raises their hand or does anything or just chime in. Just education, right? Trying to trying to learn more about business, trying to learn how to be a bit more successful. Um, that's why I read them. Just hoping yep. to glean some more knowledge. That's part of the answer, absolutely. Anybody else? I mean, I'll give you, you an offbeat one. Go ahead. Kathy, you go first. Well, I just said to check out the author, to check out their... Um, uh, just to get some history or I can't remember the word that I'm thinking of, but get a little bit of their bio, their bio. I'm thinking the word validity is coming up, but that's not the word I'm thinking of, but just, you know, to see if you agree with the person and, and you like what they're, you like kind of like a sample of what they're offering. Or maybe validate what you're thinking through somebody else. <clears throat> if that's what you were driving at. I mean, I I sometimes will read people's books, especially for the Outlier Project, uh, because I want to make them feel good. I want to read their book. I want to make them feel good. I want to write a uh, verified Amazon review for them. Um, sometimes it really doesn't have as much to do with, do I really want to read this book? Uh, and how much do I want to support somebody? Yeah, it's a little bit offbeat, but no, that's that's definitely part of it. it. It's all of that, and I would think the the main reason why someone would buy a nonfiction book is because they have a problem and they need to have it resolved, and that's why they're getting that particular book. Um, an example that I know uh, that Matthew gives is no one buys a diet book just for the pleasure of reading it. They're buying a diet book because they have some type of challenge with their health. And if they read that book and maybe apply whatever advice that author is giving, you know, they might be able to resolve whatever that health issue is. So that's usually the main reason why someone might want to buy and read a nonfiction business book. So to me, that comes to the question of, well, when you think about your business, why have a book? You have a website, you might have a podcast, you have business cards, brochures, um, you have your social media platforms. What on earth do you need a book for? And my answer usually is it's because people learn differently from one another. Some people, they learn visually. They need to see the video. They need to see images. They need to see things in order to make that connection or to have it resonate with them. Some people, it has to do with listening. So they're the ones that, hey, they got their earbuds in, they're going on a bike ride, a walk, they're driving their car, they're listening to your podcast. Because to hear that person say you need to do one, two, three, four to reach a certain point or a certain level, that's how they do it. They do it through learning. But what about the people that like to read? Yes, you got some stuff on your website, but reading is something, reading a book is very different than, you know, reading someone's website. I see um, Manola has her hand up. 
Thank you, Tim. I, I don't want to, to bring us back to your first question, but no, that's fine. Um, when you when you asked that question, I, I heard it on on two layers. One, why would a reader buy a book and why would a writer buy someone else's book? Um, so, yes, on all counts on why would a reader buy a book, but as a potential writer, um, I think someone might buy books just to be able to better sharpen their own uh, niche and writing and topic. Yeah, absolutely. You can learn different styles and different ways to bring a, bring about viewpoints and everything else. So absolutely. Um, again, when I, I always tell people, you know, I feel a book is much better than a website. And for me, that answer is that book having a book allows you to really go in deep and share your story and when you think about people who read they're making a commitment of time to read they're going in their very comfortable recliner chair they're lying down in bed maybe they're sitting outside on their back patio because it's a nice day out and they're setting aside time to read they're turning off their phone their computer their tv and they're just involved with that book that they're reading you go online and you're on someone's website. Well, what happens? You're getting notifications. You got social media distractions. Uh, next thing you know, you might be playing a game. And the whole intention of trying to read something pretty much goes out the window because you're having all these type of distractions that, that basically comes with the internet. And nobody is going to be like, oh, hey, I'm going to go to so-and-so's website and spend two hours there reading about something. I mean, first of all, it shouldn't take you two hours to read anyone's website, but no one goes to a website with the intention of reading anything and spending that much time there. It's different if you're shopping and you're going on Amazon, it's Christmas, you got a list of people and you're trying to find things for them and throw them into your cart. Of course, you're going to spend some time on that website. But just for the pure thing of reading, reading that book is going to bring you a lot more of a connection with that author and with their business and with their message than it will just go into their website. I also think it's like the elephant in the room is uh, that it's the best business card out there and it validates you whether somebody reads your book or doesn't read your book is interesting. I, yeah, I'll share this with you, Tim, because uh, you know, these folks. So I, I, Beth Goodwin was in town uh, yesterday, and we went out to lunch with Bob Duncanson, Michelle Cipriano, and Scott Thompson. Uh, yes. Anyway, so we all went to high school together, by the way, guys. So uh, they're all like, I see you all over social media. What do you do? Like, what do you do? So I'm kind of describing my two businesses, and then I mentioned the books, the books, you know, the fact that I'm a four-time author made a bigger impression on them than the fact that I founded two businesses. So yep. I think there is still a, uh, there, there's something about being able to say, you have a book, you're an author. Oh, absolutely. And, I, and I'm definitely going to get into that about the impact of a book. Um, an, another thing that I really try to educate people on, on like what a book can do, especially if you're like a business owner and you have a book. If you're sharing that with someone and they actually do take the time to read your book, you know, that's the equivalent to having a few conversations with that person and not being there. If I was to read someone's book and it takes me maybe three or four sittings to do that. That's like I had three or four conversations with this person. They're sharing their message. They're sharing their process. They're sharing their content with me. And we haven't even met yet. And already I'm getting so much from them and they don't even know who I am yet. But it's like you're having these conversations with that particular author. And to go with what Scott said, you know, with the impact of a book. Uh, what I like to say is imagine that, you know, you go to a network, an in-person network, and you meet 20 people, you shake hands, you have that small talk, you know, what do you do? What do I do? You know, how'd you find this group? Blah, blah, blah. 
it's really short conversations. You're exchanging business cards. And at the end of the day, you go home, you got 25, 30 business cards. Three or four days later, you don't even know who these people are. Their name doesn't resonate. Their company name doesn't resonate. Just doesn't just, you know, you just kind of lose that focus that you had when you were there in the moment. If someone hands you a book, you're going to remember that person's face. You're going to remember that short conversation you have had with them. And every time, even if you haven't read their book yet, every time you see that book sitting on your desk, sitting beside your bed, sitting on the passenger seat of your car, you're going to think of that person and that short conversation that you had. It's just immediately going to come back like that. And it's a great um, conversation starter. And also having that book too, you know, after so many days, people throw out your business card. They don't hand it to other people. They don't scan it and share it around. That just doesn't happen. But a book you are going to share and just kind of like, um, just to like make up an example, next on my list to read is this uh, Story Like You Mean It by Dr. Dennis. This was recommended to me to read from Scott. And Dr. Dennis was on the legend series that the Outlier uh, Project does and spoke. And I got this book. Let's say I take the time. I'm going to read his book. And as I'm reading it, I'm thinking of Jamie, who I talked to about two weeks ago, and we had an awesome conversation. If I'm reading this, and that keeps bringing me back to the conversation we have, and I feel, oh, my God, she needs to read this book. I'm going to pop this in an envelope and mail it to her saying, hey, you need to read this. If you don't have time, just chapters eight and nine. It's exactly what we talked about. And I really think it will just kind of, you know, it's going to strike a chord with you. If she then takes the time to read this book and she's like, oh, my God, Tim, I read Dr. Dennis's book and I, you know, I need to reach out to him. I want to have a conversation with him. Can you introduce me? Well, I don't know him, but I'm going to get someone who does know him and introduce you. So what am I doing? I'm calling Scott. Hey, Scott, can you do me a favor? Can you send Jamie and Dr. Dennis an email, introduce them? Jamie really wants to talk to him. She read his book. So here, Dr. Dennis is getting a very warm introduction, a lead to someone that could end up being a client of his, and he didn't do anything. I mean, his book is 2021. It's now 2023, and it's still working for him. And Again, he did absolutely nothing. It was just a recommendation from Scott that I read. I thought of Jamie. I sent it to her. She read it. Now Dr. Dennis is talking to her, and that can end up being a client of his. Who knows? But that's just the power that a book has. People share books. They don't share business cards. They don't share brochures. And it's a lot more meaningful when someone says, the conversation we had, here's a book about it. I hope this helps or uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Does a lot more than the email with the link in it saying "click here." It just just has that kind of impact. Um, one of the benefits too of having a book comes around speaking engagements. Um, people always ask, "How do I get speaking engagements with a book?" And that could be very beneficial because if you know of a conference that's being put together, and you want to be a speaker and you want to be on that stage, you're going to contact the organizer. Perhaps one of the first questions they may ask you is, do you have a book about the content you're going to share from the stage? Do you have a book? You send them that book, even if it's like, hey, just chapters three and 10 are the only two things I'm going to be talking about from the stage. That's what that organizer is going to look at. If you don't have a book, guess what? They're going to dive into your social media. And if your social media is a mess, meaning, you know, don't get me wrong, you have a right to post and say what you want on any platform. But if that doesn't resonate with that organizer, they're not going to ask you to come speak on the stage, period. And that's just that one person that could be blocking you from that event. But if you have that book and you send it to them, guess what? That's the only thing they're looking at is that book. They're not looking at anything else because everything's right there for them. Um, the benefit to me and for, I tell my clients or potential clients, uh, you know, you want to do a book. One of the great things about it is it helps you organize all your content. It helps you get all of your theories, all of your opinions, all your point of views, just everything. It really helps you to get it all in order, whether you write the book yourself or you're working with the writing coach or you're working with a ghostwriter. 
It is a great way to just organize all your content. And it is great when you're doing meetings, whether in person or even online, someone asks a question, hold on, you could flip to, you know, I wrote that in my book in chapter five. Let me just read you the first two paragraphs because it answers exactly what you just asked me. That's pretty huge. Another thing I like too, putting your book together, writing your book, by the end of it, guess what? You got a year's worth of content for your social media because you can pull out all little nuggets from your book and just set them up to post at certain times. You also have people are giving you book reviews, they're giving you feedback, or they're taking pictures like, hey, I'm, I'm in such and such a place and I just got so-and-so's book. And they're posting that all over the place. And a lot of times they'll throw a link in there, say, go to Amazon and get this book that, you know, I read it and it was just, you know, mind blowing or whatever. And I think it would help whoever. And they might even tag some of their friends to be like, hey, you know, you need to get a copy of this book. You need to read this book. So um, the one thing I want to ask is, what do you think a book can do for your particular business? Don't everybody talk at once. I would say, Tim, for me, uh, probably the books, which have absolutely nothing to do with my business. They're books of gratitude for life lessons learned and their anthologies, as you know, um, have probably been one of the top two or three drivers of business for me yep mm -hmm. i mean so I that's probably what i probably was... made collectively just you know well millions of dollars off of writing books that i give all the money to charity yep and they have nothing to do with my business other yep. than a give we have a big give back component so in that yep. way it does because i get people that ask me well i don't know what to do for a book and you just got to do what you feel is right. And to use um, Kathy as an example, most people do their book, they launch it. And then like maybe six, nine months later, they pare it down. They take all the actionable items and they make a workbook. And, and Kathy did that total opposite. Talk about not being ordinary. She starts out, she just launched her workbook a while back instead of doing the book first. So here she's just going right into, these are the action steps you got to take. So that's just, you know, that's why I just tell people, you got to do what's right for you. And that's absolutely, you know, been blown out of the water for Kathy and what she's done. That was uh, my example of healing from codependency was not having to follow what I thought was the, the, the way to do it. Um, and just following what I needed to do for myself. That was an example of the healing. Yep. I see uh, Matt. Yeah, Tim, I was actually just going to say you kind of hit it home for me, having done this for years and even in my presentation saying how important it is to have a book as a business card, mail it ahead. Uh, none of my books that I've written have anything to do with what I do for a living anymore. Um, they were just kind of, as, um, as Scott said, life's lessons, just giving back. And I've put my nose down now and gotten to working on the book on ghostwriting. So this way, when I have those conversations with people about what does a ghostwriter do? How do I know to have picked the, any of those million questions? All I've got to do now is when I finish the book is mail them a copy of that book or hand it to them in person and just say, hey, here's all your questions answered. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Manola. I, I think or, or I hope that I'm not too, um, you know, off the mark when, when I believe that a book about your business also um, accelerates the decision in, in a potential customer's mind if they like you or not before they agree with what you say. I mean, is this a person that I'm curious about? Is this a person that I would enjoy having a conversation with? Um, so um, I, I see that oftentimes we overlook the fact that a book speaks um, just as loud about its author than about the knowledge in it. Yeah, I, I, I love how when you do a book, especially like you're doing a business book, but you could also share with your reader 
not doing like an autobiography, but you can say, share so much with the reader about yourself. And, um, you know, just a few days ago, I finished reading uh, Wonder Hell by Laura Gassner Otting. And I mean, just her book is, you know, it's, it's motivational, it's inspirational, it's, it's also, you know, even entertaining, but you put all that aside, she drops all these things in about her, about herself that would never really come up in a conversation. And um, I don't know who else might have read her book, or you might have been on that, um, the Legend series when we had her on. So like, let's say other than Scott, who's probably had numerous conversations with her. I mean, who would have known that she had taken and done improv and stand up comedy classes? Who would have known in, in her own words, I suck at math and I hate it. Anytime there's something to do with numbers, it goes to her husband. He has to take care of that. But these are the type of things you could just drop in a book or make some type of comparison to or your own personal experience about. And again, it's not these kind of things are not stuff that's just going to pop out in a conversation when you're trying to, you know, maybe, uh, you know, land that client and you're speaking about your business. You just don't all of a sudden say, oh, yeah, well, when I was in high school and I played football, this happened. But in a book, you're able to kind of jump back and forth and, and do different things with it that you really can't do uh, in a conversation. And I would personally suggest to, to anyone on here, you know, um, you know, set up a call with Kathy and ask her, you know, what's different now that she's had a book out for a while or talk to Bruce and ask him what success has a book brought to some of the clients that he's worked with. And um, also, too, on this call are, uh, you know, Stanley and Matthew. They're both ghostwriters and, you know, we're all in the same mastermind group. I mean, get, you know, ask them for their emails and reach out to them and talk. It's just, you know, from all of us, you will get all different perspectives, all different experiences, but it's all the same thing. The book made a huge impact uh, in their business. Um, two things that I want to touch on are two mistakes that people make and then two must-haves in your book. And when it comes to doing a book, especially people like the first time they're doing a book, the, the, the biggest mistake I find, the two biggest mistakes I feel, they try to cram 30 years of experience and knowledge into 200 pages. And that's not what your reader wants. What your reader wants is just a solution to their current situation and perhaps advice on how to prevent that situation from reoccurring. It doesn't matter that something happened in the Jimmy Cotter administration and then the Clinton administration did this with it and then this. They don't care about what led up to it. They only care that you can resolve it. So I always say, pick one thing, focus on it, hammer it down, build it out. And if you got more to say, you do another book. You still got more to say, do book three. I mean, if people loved your first book and second book, they're, they're probably gonna like your third book. And the other thing that people try to do is they put way too much of a sales pitch in their book. And just like we said, this is your book is just supposed to be a calling card. It's something that people should read. They should learn from it. They should connect with it. They should learn about you and why you do what you do. And then they're going to reach out to you just organically. You don't need to put in there, go to my website, act now, sign up for this, join my course, join my retreat. Don't put all of that kind of stuff in there. At the end of the book, your website's there, your LinkedIn's there, your Twitter handle's there, whatever, people will find you. Especially, you know, they obviously somehow know you because they got the book or they know someone that knows you because you got the book. Um, I feel the two must-haves in your book uh, are examples from clients. Even if you need to change their name or change their location, whatever, that's where people resonate. They resonate with the people's story. If Bill and Mary went through something, and then, you know, they reached out to Steve Thomas and he helped them resolve their problem. Guess what? They're going to reach out to Steve because they're going to say, Bill and Mary went through this and you, and you totally knocked it out of the park for them. He's going to knock it out of the park for me. That's what they're going to resonate with. And you want to do a very good balance of those client examples, your own personal experiences, and even some celebrity experiences. So it's a name that everybody knows, whether that be you know, Michael Jordan, or maybe Elvis Presley, or whoever. It's just that's names that people know, they know those what they did to make their mark 
in the world and things like that. And just to quickly refer back to Laura's book of Wonder Hell, I don't know if she had a template or if someone helped her or if she did it on her own, doesn't matter. But her book, aside from the content, the, the perfect example of how you balance. I have so many stories about clients, so many stories about myself, and then a few celebrities thrown in just for like good measure. It was the absolute perfect balance of that. And that's aside from, like I said, the content that she provided with everybody. And the second thing, I just learned this recently in the past couple months. I did not know this and it kind of blew my mind. But they say the thing that readers resonate most with business books are the childhood stories of what was the catalyst for what you do. What was it in your childhood? And to me, childhood could be, you know, maybe college all the way back, depending on where you are in your business. But what was it in your childhood that caused you to take the path you did and to end up where you are? And yes, there could be changes along the way. But when I was thinking that aside from writing, I think about for, for those who know me, you know, you know, myself and my wife, we live and travel and work out of our motor home. And we go to Florida and, and Tennessee and New York and New Hampshire, and we just stay at different places and, and just travel around and we live and work out of that. And when I think about it, I think back now to when I was like, you know, five, six years old, uh, one Christmas, Santa left me this big kind of like Tonka toy. And it was an RV where the roof opened up and you had all the furniture inside and a couple little people and they had a little dog. And I used to pretend that they drove all over the place and they had all these adventures and now I think like, holy crap, you know, here I am 45, 50 years later, it's exactly what I'm doing. And never would have thought that when I was five or six, I was just a toy that I played with. And even my mom said, sometimes she had to take that thing and hide it from me because I wouldn't play with my other toys that I had. <laughs> so it, it's just, uh, you know, it, that's the stories that people really resonate with when they're reading your book is they like those childhood stories of what you know, what was it that made you do this? And unfortunately, it could be something traumatic that happened and it caused you to take the path you did. It could be something exciting and fun that got you there. Um, for everybody, it's it's obviously a different story, but they said that's one of the things readers resonate with is that childhood story. What in your childhood did, did you know, what happened in your childhood that now you're doing in your adulthood or in your business life? So... And that's a great thing to put into a book. Again, it doesn't need to be a whole autobiography, but just to have a couple paragraphs of, hey, you know, this is what I do. Why do I do this? Well, when I was seven years old, this happened. So that's about all I really have. I'm open for any questions or any comments. Tim, when do you... When do you suggest, or how do you suggest people decide whether to use a ghostwriter or not? Um, I think there's a few variables in there. I think most people use a ghostwriter because of time. They're so busy running their business and whatever outside their business, they're like, I don't have time to sit down in front of a computer and write. Um, there's other people that say, I don't know how to write. I always say, you know how to write. You just don't know what to write. Um, and they just, they might be kind of like a scatterbrain and they're trying to get their thoughts organized and things like that. As far as like, I would always at least suggest reach out to a ghostwriter and talk to him or her just to kind of get an idea of what that involves. And then maybe you're better off just working with a coach where you're doing the writing, but you kind of have that developmental editor looking over your shoulder and you know, keeping you on track. Uh, Jamie had her hand up first. Same kind of question around, I mean, how do you, how do you find, you know, editor and then make those determinations to around publishing, whether you self-publish, et cetera? Um, part of that would depend on, on your book. What is the purpose of your book? Um, again, many of my clients, they're not trying to sell their book. They're just giving it away, hoping to get that speaking engagement, get a couple clients. It's a calling card, just like you would a business card. But there are some people that are looking for sales of their book for different reasons. Um, I would just say your best bet is just to have a conversation with 
people that have self-published a book and people that maybe got picked up by a traditional publisher, ask them what kind of route that was, the path to get there, and what are the pros and cons of both? Because you know everything has you know a yin and yang or whatever. So I would just do that and then just kind of see how your book fits into that and you know what you would do from there. And then one really quick too. Yeah. How what what do you think on average? So your your average two hundred page book, what's the cost outlay that you should expect or budget for? For I mean, doing the ghost writing? Well, just okay, yeah, just in general. So if okay, I can write, but I'm not a great writer, got a decent topic. I mean, what what would you say somebody should budget if they just in general? I know that's kind of a it's probably a wide range, but yeah, it's 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 really gonna depend on who you go with. If you're just looking for someone just to ghost write it, it could be anywhere from like 15 to, to probably 30 grand just for them to write it, depending. Other people have, I know um, myself and Stanley do this, is, you know, besides writing the book, you know, we also do the book cover, the layout, the editing, the ISBN uh, assignment, and, you know, the ebook conversion and all of that. And that can vary back and forth depending on, you know, it's really going to come down to what you're looking for. If you end up going with hy hybrid publishers, they're also going to throw in, hey, we also do marketing of your book. And they're going to help you with the sales and then split royalties. So they're probably going to have different fees for each. Whereas a traditional publisher, they're going to want to know your marketing plan if they're interested in your book. How are you going to sell X amount of copies in X amount of time? But you're going to have to first probably get an agent to kind of go at bat for you with the publishers. But in that end, it costs you nothing but time and effort and energy to get the agent and then to kind of go through the process of connecting with the publisher that way. So it, it really just comes down onto what your overall goal is with your book. But uh, I see two hands up. I don't know who was first. Manola. So I, I have a question. Um, and that was a decision that I had to make. Um, and it's about writing in another language than your mother tongue. Because we touched on how loud the book speaks about who you are but we also want to use the book to build credibility so there's the um you know the perfection attraction um so english is my third language i wrote it in english um and and the conversation i had with my editor is that look i speak with an accent and i want that accent to be in 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 the book um, now, I don't want a perfect book, but I want a book that it's easily readable by native speakers so that they don't lose time on what does this mean. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really curious to hear thoughts about, you know, um, writing in a different language than, than your mother tongue and how much um, upgrade should that have? Wow. That's a huge question. Um, that I don't know. I don't really have too much experience with um, someone coming and English is not their first language. Um, I do know like Kathy and I, when I was helping with the uh, Standing O series, we had one person who wrote their chapter in Italian. And I think they just went through some maybe software to get it translated and Kathy and I were going back and forth, like, what do you really think he's saying here? What sentence should this, how should this read? And, you know, her and I were going back and forth with trying to kind of, you know, really tighten that up and, and make it readable for, you know, for everyone that's going to get that book. Um, I, I do agree. You probably want to keep your accent there and you might enunciate words, certain words differently than than how anyone else might that that is a native English speaker. Um, I would I would almost say I would just do that, not throughout the whole book, but I would definitely just drop them and sprinkle them throughout the book so that you're definitely shining through. But it depends on, I, it's hard to answer that really. Um, because I would say if you're gonna, if you want someone in your native tongue to read it, I would just try to get it translated into that language for them versus them trying to, to read English and understand English. And that's not their, you know, that's not their, their native tongue. I think your book would be phenomenal on audio on audible. Uh, 
you know, just like Kofi doing, uh, you know, his own, as opposed to, you know, he wanted Morgan Freeman to do it. Uh, and turned out, you know, the best advice he got was, you know, do, do it yourself because that his, his voice speaks, uh, loud and clear. I'll, I'll do that. And I, I, my non-negotiable there was that there will be the book and then there will be a bonus track with, uh, you know, bloopers, um, whether I try 10 times to pronounce words that I know I could never, ever pronounce correctly to save my life um, to, you know, whether I started crying or laughing or anything in between. So thank you so much, Tim. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Manola, also in my first book, this is uh, before I was I was working with Tim. I was working with a, a company called Eaton Press, and we had a we had a woman. Her name's Alina Bakova. She's a supermodel from Ukraine, and she wrote a chapter. And uh, I remember the editor call or the the woman from Eden Press calling and saying like they wanted to change it dramatically um and I'm like no so I think Kathy and I convinced them to make some modifications but if you read that chapter in the original standing O, Alina Bakova's chapter uh it's very obvious that you know English is not her native tongue um, and I think it would have, if we had completely homogenized it, it would have lost a tremendous amount of the impact that it had. I really think it would have, it would have completely changed it. And it's a phenomenal chapter. Yeah. Bruce? You're on mute, Bruce. Let's just keep, let's just let him just. Sorry. <laughs> So See how be, long he goes before he notices. Exactly. <laughs> I'm still I'm recovering from my honeymoon. <laughs> so I'd be curious to get your opinion as well as uh, like um, Matthew and Stanley about caveat emptor with the ghostwriting mills out there that will overpromise and underdeliver and say, oh, we could do everything, soup to nuts, the ghostwriting, the publishing the marketing for $8,500 or 10 grand or 12 grand. Um, and we can bring it to market in three or four months. Um, I've encountered this before and I don't know how they can make these promises. I think you get what you pay for in life. That axiom is just unavoidable. Um, what about uh, that component here? to just address that potential elephant in the room. Yeah, I, I don't know how they do any and or all of that at such, you know, at such an under cost compared to what like the norm is, at least with the masterminds I belong to. And, and like you mentioned, Stanley and Matthew, um, I don't know if now they just use AI. Do they have certain templates? Are they maybe using some services overseas that are obviously a lot less expensive than um, keeping it in, in the United States or something. Um, I always do. I always tell my clients, I'm like, fine, if you want to go with them and get everything for, you know, you know, 8,500 bucks, make sure you first go and get a couple of books that they've done, spend that money on Amazon to get a few copies of whatever and look through it and read it and see if that's, see if that's up to your standard. You know, look, really look at the book cover, start reading the material. Has it been edited or was it just ran through like Grammarly where Grammarly might point something out, but it could be yes or no, whether you use that, uh, you know, whether you use that suggestion or not. I think Matt's got his hand up. Still with us, Mr. Harms. Sorry, I thought I unmuted. I was just going to chime in on Manola's uh, question because we recently had a client who was born in Italy, lived the last 20 years in Portugal, and wrote books in both.
both ones, but wanted his newest book to be available in English, which he spoke fairly fluently, but it was it was his third language. There were a lot of cultural nuances. Um, so we didn't necessarily ghostwrite for him. We just did a very strong developmental edit to make sure everything that he had originally written in Portuguese translated correctly, like Tim was mentioning before, um, you know, trying to decipher what it meant. So having access to him and him not just running it through a translation software made it a lot more impactful because we were able to talk through a lot of those finer points with him and make sure what he was trying to say is really what came across in the finished product. Yeah, it's always good if you can go back to the source and, and ask them instead of just translate it word for word uh, in those situations for sure, because that's where you're going to get it's not so much what they say you want to capture what they mean or what they're trying to convey versus, you know, word for word what they might have said, because how how someone says something in Spanish or French is not necessarily the same way we might have that same expression, you know, in English or any other language. Mm -hmm. Just just to clarify, my question was not so much about a book that is translated into English, but a book that is written in English from the very first, you know, from the start. And, and then the conversation is, hey, I don't want this to be a perfect as if a native speaker would have written it, uh, but I still don't want it to be, you know, um, clunky. So um, it, it was not about having it translated into English, but making it um, more easy um, to be read by native speakers. Yeah, I, I think that would definitely work for people that know you, because like Scott's going to read your book and be like, oh, my God, he's going to hear your voice, you know, in his head as he's reading it. But once you start getting outside of your circle, some people that might be difficult reading for them because they're going to be like, was this book even edited or I don't understand, you know, something's missing here and and things like that. So that's why I say it's better. I feel my suggestion would be, yes, do that, but just have it sprinkled throughout and not the whole book be that way. You know, definitely work with someone that can help you organize it. And um, I don't want to use the word cleanup, but, you know, they could definitely make it more English, but still keep a lot of you and your voice in there. So this way, when you get past that circle of people that know you that are going to hear your voice, other people will definitely be able to get your message and they'll be able to get the content and that it won't come up as kind of like maybe a language barrier in any way. And they'll still probably get your accent as well, because you'll have certain words written a certain way, just so that it's enunciated the way you would probably say it if you were speaking to them bruce yeah tim i wanted to build on my question and just throw it out to the group uh as kind of another um point to be aware of when i was um a guest on a the clubhouse app to give a talk about the power of publishing a business book someone had made the suggestion that um, this is the path of least resistance could be you could just kind of speak your book into like a dictaphone. Uh, you could do it like over a three day period and get you can rush it to market. And she was encouraging people to do that. And I vehemently disagreed with it. It was somebody who um, was on the call as an attendee. And I thought that, you know, of all the things in the world, you do not want to rush your way through publishing a book. And I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that as well, um, because obviously, if you just want to put it out there uh, to give it away, to, to increase your street cred right away, you want to maybe maybe you're on a budget and that kind of thing. Uh, these are all good points. However, um, is it really worth trying to rush uh, what you want to publish to market in that way i mean it, it's doable uh but again it's just a caveat i wanted to throw out to the group yeah i i definitely wouldn't suggest rushing it i, I definitely think each part of the process you need to kind of take time with even your your layout design even your book cover and everything and i i always suggest to people yes it's great to do talk to text 
to kind of get your ideas out, to kind of get your content out there. But then you either need to work with the writing coach or, or an editor to really kind of tighten that up and straighten it because I, you know, talking and reading are two very different things. When you're talking with someone, you're thinking about what your reply is going to be. Uh, there's a lot of repetition in conversation. Uh, when you're reading a book, you know, you that reader has time to stop. They could pause, they could reflect, they can reread what they wrote, they could digest it, they might even pick it apart. They can do all different things that you can't do in a conversation. I wouldn't be having a conversation with Scott and all of a sudden be like, stop, stop, wait, I got to think about that for a minute. You just don't do that. But if I'm reading Scott's book, I have all the time in the world to be like, oh, let me reread that because I'm really trying to get exactly what Scott's trying to convey here with this couple of paragraphs or this chapter or something like that. But I, I definitely think talk to text is great because you could do that initial dump. You can get a lot out and it's probably faster than writing. It's faster than, um, you know, trying to type it out or anything else. But yeah, I, I don't believe in, in, you know, rushing that at all. Um, I always, even when my clients say I need a book by then, I go back and see how much it is. And if I tell a person, you know, I always tell someone, you know, we do your book maybe in nine months. And I usually probably hit the mark of like six or seven months, depending on what the project is. I would think that the only exception would be if you're purely doing it for some sort of credibility. This, this would be a very interesting study. Uh, I don't think this data is available, but I would imagine the average business book uh, is read by a very small population of the people that have it on their bookshelf. Like I, I would, I have an insane, I get sent a ton of books and I read almost none of them. Uh, I may dip in a little bit, but I don't think I'm that unusual. It's not because I'm being sent a lot of books. I think there's a lot of people that don't read, don't read books cover to cover. And if your sole purpose was, I just want the credibility of my name on a book, that would probably be the only reason why you'd kind of rush it and it wouldn't really make a, a huge difference. Yeah. I, I've definitely had my fair share of clients and I'm sure probably Bruce, Matt, Stanley, you know, we're all in the same, you know, we're all in the same arena of people. That's the sole purpose that they did a book. They just, I want to be an author and I want a bestseller because they want that on their resume. They want that on their social media. And it's yeah. something that they could just, you know, it's just another title to add to their, you know, to their line of whatever else title they got. But Matt. <clears throat> I mean, I agree, Tim, with you and Bruce. It, a book is credibility, but when done poorly, it's going to do far more damage than good. Um, especially even if you've got the person who only reads three pages of your book, if they find typos, if they find thoughts that don't make logical sense, that book has now become a reflection of who you are as a person and a professional. And if you didn't take the time and care to put out your best work, why would they hire you over somebody else who does exactly right. what you do? Yeah, I've, I've heard that before. If there are errors in your book, well, what errors are there in your service or product? Yep. Yeah. And Not your really. and your reviews. Okay. I mean, I look at reviews to kind of give me an idea of, is this book legit? Is it good? You know, quantity yeah. and then, you know, what the ratings are. And yeah, if, if you get somebody that has low low ratings uh that that's a that's a big red flag yeah yaro thank you thank you for this tim i'm a, a newbie in the contemplation of writing my story but that has segued into business writing so i've got a whole nother thing brewing now so thank you for sharing this insight um you did just mention about bestsellers though and for the naive ear that i am can you elaborate on what what constitutes a bestseller i feel like a lot of books hit the shelves and and have that accolade so what is that i guess what's the weight of it and then what's the process 
um, from your experience in in getting that accreditation for a, a new book. Yeah, I I think like you say, like the the weight of a bestseller that's to the individual. But does it mean any? You know, if I find a book and I'm going to read it, I personally don't care if it's a best selling book or if it's not. It's just a story I'm going to enjoy, or it has the content or material that I need. Um, as far as being a bestseller, there's a lot of people that are quote unquote bestsellers, but they really haven't sold a lot of books. Um, I know something that someone does, which is, um, I don't know how to say it, then it's kind of like a, a gimmick that they do is, oh, hey, I'm releasing my book on this day at this time. So in this two hour period, you get all your friends and family, everyone to buy your book. Guess what? You had the most sales within that time frame, within that category you're an Amazon bestseller. And that's what a lot of them do. As far as trying to get to be like a Wall Street Journal bestseller or New York Times bestseller, then that is selling like, last I knew, I think New York Times was you got to do 9,000 copies a week to even break like the top 20 of being a bestseller uh, on the New York Times bestselling list. But a lot of it to me, I always feel, at least me personally, I don't care about being a bestseller. I just care that I'm reaching the audience that I feel needs this and hopefully they're getting something from it and it's resonating with them and that my advice or knowledge that I share is working for them. And, you know, I much rather sell 10,000 copies over 10 years versus trying to sell 10,000 copies in one month just to be a bestseller. Yeah, I hear you. Thank you. Yeah. It's kind of interesting if you look at what John Rowland has done with his book, Giftology. You know, he wrote that now, I don't know, 10 years ago. Uh, He sold more copies of it last year than he had ever sold before. So he continues to kind of just really milk that for all it's worth. And it is a phenomenal book. It's one of the best business books I've ever read. Um, but it doesn't have to be like an overnight wonder. And I don't know if his has ever been quote unquote bestseller yeah. outside of Amazon, which I think is a little gimmicky. It, it definitely can be. And, you know, it, it's kind of funny because the, the bestselling status is regardless of who's giving it, whether it's a newspaper or Amazon or anything, always has to do with so many sales in a short amount of time where there are books that have been around forever that are probably sold millions and millions of copies, but it's been spread over the course of time. If you take like a Mark Twain book, well, that's been for sale since like the 1870s. So how many copies has that sold? Because a lot of times it's required that you read that in in school. Some people are Mark Twain fans or they go visit his house in Connecticut, which is a museum. What are you doing? You're buying a book of his on the gift shop on the way out. How many sales does he have still? And he's been, you know, and he's been dead for a hundred years and he's still outselling tons of authors. Manola. Well, fair warning, this might be a terribly stupid question, but I will risk it. Um, And I'm also struggling with making a decision on this topic, which is hardcover versus paperback. And Um, I come from a place, I am an obsessive reader. So I read on average four books, cover to cover every week. So for me, hardcovers are just not okay. Weight wise, you know, I read in bed. So, so many times I got the hardcover, you know, coming down my nose and my glasses and, and, and then it's not so comfortable. But I can see why hardcovers, they come with this extra oomph of, you know, something. Um, So I'm really curious about, is hardcover almost like a must have for um, packaging? Does that come with an extra statement of something? Or something else that I, I can't even think about at the moment. Yeah. Um, I think for the most part, people, when they're doing their books, they're going paperback and that's mostly just a budget thing. 
Um, but there are some people that they, they want that, you know, I mean, a hard covered book obviously is probably more impressive than a paperback book. But to me, it would just depend on, you know, what you're doing. I mean, the content's the same. It's just the cover's either hard or it's soft or, or it's on a device and people are reading it on their phone or their Kindle or something. So to, to me, it's definitely what's between the covers, not what the covers are made of. But I always leave that up to my to my clients. And a lot of times when we go and we get pricing and they see, oh, I could print, print a paperback for $3 or a hardcover for 25 then they start doing the math of, oh, I need 500 copies. You know, they're immediately jumping back down. Yeah, let's just do this in paperback. Um, but it also depends where you're going. You know, if you're going to speak in front of a certain group um, that's very maybe like a high value people are there or whatever, and you want to make that huge impression, it might be worth having 20 copies in hardcover just for that particular presentation. And you could sell them for, you know, more money than you would a paperback. Um, a lot of it is just some people just want that status. I mean, we just finished a book with a client and she wanted, you know, her ebook. She wanted paperback. She wanted hardcover. She wanted audio. She just wanted everything all to release at once. And I just brought in the people that, you know, could do those different things. So. <laughs> Tim, I wanted to inject something to this discussion. It really depends on the length of the, or the scope of the project too. If you've got uh, a book that's like 50,000 words or 100,000 words, which is a little more meaty than, say, you know, 30,000, uh, then it it makes sense to have a hard cover. I mean, you can have a hard cover with a tiny book, too, but it, in my opinion, looks a little silly. Uh, but if you've got a pretty long book and budget is not um, a factor, then by all means, you can go that avenue. Yes, absolutely. You were about to say something else, Manola, too? Yeah, from where I'm looking at it, um, I would actually imagine that I would go for a paperback if the book is heavier, <laughs> because then the, the hardcover would just make it, you know, a doorstopper. Um, but um, again, this might be very subjective and it might be driven by so many, you know, personal preferences in, in the mix. But I do appreciate the, the insights. Yeah. Well, e even with me, just like I'm mentioning this book here, this, you know, story like you mean it being paperback. You know, this is a lot easier to hold with yeah. one hand and hold it open yeah. while I'm reading versus a, if this was a hard covered book yeah. where you feel you have to have two hands on it and hold it open. So a lot of it, you know, paperback to me is just a little more convenient. And and just like Bruce said, if I'm reading a Stephen King book, I much rather have that in paperback because the hardcover would probably weigh three pounds. And after a while, you can only hold that up for so long while you're trying to read it versus the paperback. So, it, it, you know, there's a lot of variables that go into it, but it definitely yeah. comes down to that author's preference of what they want to do. It's It's their book. It's their budget. Thank you. I think a business vanity. book, a lot of it's vanity. Uh, you know, I mean, I definitely send out a lot of copies of Standing O, and I never send out uh, anything other than hardcover. Yeah. I mean, I even tell I people. Love the, I don't love the Amazon hardcover, though. I actually hate it. Yeah. A lot of it's going to be your, your printer's quality, but, you know, I even tell people depending on their book, like, you know, if you're doing a book that has to do with like uh search engine optimization or algorithms and things like that, I always say, you know what, you don't want a hardcover book or a paperback. You just want an ebook so you can easily update it. And when you update that book, guess what? It gets updated on everybody's device who bought and downloaded your book at any time. Because that just changes so much, your paperback's going to be obsolete in less than probably three to six months. So why spend all that money to print all these and get it out there? And then six months later, it's 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 no good. This has been great. So. Is is anyone not contemplating writing a book? Steve, you ever thought of writing one? All the time. Really? 
Well, yeah. I know your wife is prolific. Wife's the writer, yeah. I just got to figure out what on, and and uh, I thought about business, but I I'm at the point I might even change what I'm doing business wise. So, I guess I could still use it. Interesting. So you think you have a topic? Uh, yeah. I know that's unique? an effective answer. No, I mean, I could talk about what I've done business-wise, but then my question in my mind is, if I change business and do something completely different, would that be a waste? Gotcha. I talk about, you know, benefits consulting and, and our healthcare restructuring, and I decide to go do something completely different. I think of the, you could do it as far as, you know, maybe these are the principles of certain things or lessons that you've learned and everything that would still resonate regardless of what business you transfer uh, into. Right. It's a good thought. I second that. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I, uh, I haven't even told you this, Tim, yet, uh, but Kathy knows. So I don't know how many of you were uh, with us when we did our Who's Your Oprah curriculum the last of weeks so i'm writing who's your oprah the book but it's going to be very short like very short i would say between it's going to be under 100 pages because i want it to be just all meat and like a field guide that you would actually yeah. use because that's kind of how that whole system of building relationships is. So it'll be interesting uh, to see how people, to see if, how people receive a book that is, because mo I do think most books could probably be half the length, but oh, people yeah. just add a lot of bullshit in them so that they're, they've got more heft to them. But uh you know, a lot of books could be probably five pages. No, nope. well, I've done that before. Be I've read a book short. and I'm like, this would have been a good pamphlet. You know, it's like <laughs> just crazy. Yeah. Six pages and hard covers. Yes. From my yeah. academic brain, it's because that's how we're taught to write. Like you have to write a five page paper. Your thesis has to be 30 pages. And you're like, I don't need that much time to say what I need to say. And they're like, well, it needs to be that long. And so you just get trained to add a bunch of stuff that's unnecessary into your yeah. writing. Well, if you're in grade school, it was very, 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 very fun. Right. <laughs> hey, Scott, you got to get Oprah to write your forward to the book. Honestly, the biggest uh, the biggest thing we've we've had is trying to figure out whether legally I can use Who's Your Oprah as the title of the book. And I've told Kathy that if Oprah sues me, it would be the greatest thing that would ever happen to the book. So I'm, I'm actually, <laughs> it's, it's complimentary to her. So I don't know why in the world she would have an issue with it, uh, because I'm literally saying she has the, she's the person that has the most access on Earth. Um, but yeah, little, little controversy there would actually be really good. She's probably public domain, you know. I don't think I can put her picture on it, but I don't know. Kathy, not, Kathy scared me a little bit last week. With that's uh, when you're going to get sued. You put her picture in in there. Yeah. As long as they spell your name correctly. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Thanks, guys. Tim, this is great. Thank you, Thank you. Tim. You're the man. Thank All you, right. everybody. Everyone's books will uh, be out in nine months. Yeah. <laughs> See you guys. Yeah. You got my message, Scott. If Jeff wants this, you could share it with him. Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank okay. you. Yep. Thank awesome. you, Tim. I'll see thank you guys you. tomorrow at noon, hopefully. Thank yes. you. Bye-bye. Yeah.